what are we creating robots for because it's just fun and cool? And what are we creating robots for because there's actually a business case and it makes sense, it saves money, it does the job better, it stops people from getting hurt. Welcome to People Who Perform, the Real Estate Careers Podcast. Each episode will bring you conversations from business leaders and up and coming stars in the commercial real estate industry in Canada. Our guests will share their unique career journeys passions, and advice on what it takes to be successful in this industry. This podcast is brought to you by Highview Partners, connecting people who perform in Canadian real estate. I'm your host, Nicola Denning-Miller, and today I have the pleasure of connecting you with Kimberly Train. Kim has been with Oxford Properties for over 20 years in various capacities and currently provides leadership to the customer service and procurement programs for Oxford's direct drive sites across Canada. Her focus is to drive strategy around KPIs and standards and support prop tech innovation adoption for the global portfolio. Kim has been very successful at enhancing the performance, the quality of programs and teams in which she leads which in turn maximizes tenant retention and operational efficiencies while striving for value, innovation and governance. A strong collaborator, a supportive and influential team lead and a self-proclaimed Jill of all trades, it brings me great pleasure having Kim join us today. A very warm welcome to you this morning, Kim. I'm really happy to have you as my guest today because you've got a very compelling story to tell. I mean, you've been on a very unique journey over the last 25 years and it's led you into a pretty distinctive role within our industry. So I'm sure that our listeners are going to find it very interesting today. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, What was your first job in real estate and what valuable lessons did you learn, Kim? My first job in real estate was at Cushman, actually, or it was LePage at the time, Royal LePage. And I was an analyst coming straight out of school. And uh, it was during the recession in the 90s. And the only place that was hiring that was in this commercial real estate world at the time, people coming out of school were the brokerage houses into this analyst role. And so as it ended out, all the people that I graduated with had spread themselves out at all the different brokerage houses. So it was a great connection for me to be able to reach out to this friend who I had shared notes with at university or this other person who I had done group work at a university. We had this uh, strong network right from the beginning. As far as a valuable lesson, what did I learn? Pretty quickly, I learned that I work better personally an environment, we're competitive, but we're working together as a team for a single goal, united. Being in the brokerage, the goal of the brokerage is to have you transition from that research and analyst role into a sales role. And I just found that it was not going to be a good fit for me and for my personality because they were each working on their own individual goals. And I felt I needed to be in a place where the entire organization was working towards a single goal together. So rather than being a sole contributor, you realize quite early on that you're a people person and you, you know, give and take a lot of energy by working with others. Absolutely. That just wasn't an environment that I felt comfortable working in. I would rather feel comfortable talking to everybody and sharing ideas and having us all work together in a collaborative style. And that's okay. It was a good lesson and other people work differently. And that's great. So in terms of investing yourself and continuing to learn and grow, can you share a little bit more about what you've done there? So as far as uh, investing myself, I'm continuously going to conferences, reaching out uh, in my network, building my network with people within the industry, both on the vendor side, as well as on the uh, the landlord side and on the, the tech space, to be honest, because that's my most recent Uh, Prop tech is the area where I'm mostly trying to grow right now. I've also done the more conventional methods of going back to Ivy for leadership training or Schulich for negotiation training. And I'm very involved with Toronto Crew. And there's a lot of opportunity within Toronto Crew through their uh, leadership development program, as well as a safe environment to learn to run a a committee of individuals who are all volunteering their time 
So you learn a lot of people management skills in, in that environment, in a safe environment versus being thrown into it immediately into your work environment. So I have to say that I learned how to best manage the people aspect of my job through the committee roles that I've had and the yeah and the board roles that I've had with Toronto Crew. And in terms of the different committees that you've been on, which one would you say was your favorite? People would expect me to say golf because for the longest period of time, I was involved with the golf committee. Uh, when I first joined Toronto Crew, everybody who was a new member was thrown immediately at a committee because it's a great opportunity to, to network yourself right from the get-go, even with a small group of people. So I went from being a member in that first year to being vice chair the next year and then chairing it for multiple years before actually going into the board and having a report to me under the board as well as programs. And then having my second stint on the board being uh, women's leadership development as well as real jobs day. So um, I'd have to say, which was my favorite? I may have to say being the director of programs and, uh, and women's leadership development, just because of the nature of uh, the dynamics in those groups and how engaged those teams are and how they're constantly working on what's the next event, how will it bring value to Toronto Crew. So I, I enjoyed that. Golf was a single goal at the end of, you know, at the end of that each term, which was fun. And it was a great opportunity for me to learn. But I think uh, as far as what did I get fulfilled most about was being part of uh, programs and women's leadership development. Wonderful. Now, outside of your business, what are you doing to stay connected to the wider industry? Outside of my business, um, I speak on panels, I suppose that would uh, help. I'm often brought into robotics panels, believe it or not because of my engagement with uh, robotic scrubbers on the cleaning side. I'm very involved with cleaning programs uh, at Oxford and setting strategy for that and working with the teams that we have across Canada around that. Uh, and very early on, we were approached by one particular robotics company to test drive their units. And from that, I've, I've learned a lot more about all these other different companies who provide similar products and what the value they bring to real estate and productivity and, and cleaning and the vision of the future. So that's one way I've stayed connected is through doing panels, uh, conferences or other types of events. Now, how important has your education been in getting to where you are now? In my case, my education has a big part to do with my success and where I am in the industry right now. And, and it built me for the skills that I needed to be able to do them. I did urban development at Western and it was such a diverse program, which included everything from courses in the biz school to uh, law courses, obviously geography, because it's a, considered to be a geography piece, economics. It was just a very diverse program. And we actually built these performas as part of it for these pseudo or pretend uh, development projects. That was a big part and having to do the business case around it. Now I look at contracts. So it was very helpful actually doing the law piece. I work in a business environment where we have to do business cases. The exposure that I had had to that has been very helpful. Real estate finance piece that I had taken at university that has been maybe the most valuable lesson that I have learned and been able to apply in my role. I find that uh, at, from the beginning, so 25 years ago, not a lot of people had spreadsheet skills, to be honest, unless you were in accounting back then. So it gave me a bit of a leg up compared to some of my peers. Even today, there's things that I still lean back to to apply moving forward. What's the greatest lesson that you've taken from failure, Kim? So the greatest lesson I've taken from failure, we had a situation that I won't go too into detail with in about five or six years ago, where we tried to uh, apply a part of a business to a certain region who uh, rejected it. We just couldn't deliver what they needed at the time. And so even though we thought we could. So the greatest lesson I learned from that is to 
properly learn what I'm going to say your audience needs and to adapt and grow and then be able to work with the different groups to actually create the model that will work for them moving forward. The benefit of having gone through that experience was that it actually gave me the business case to transition a business from what we were doing before to how we could do it to position ourselves for the future. If it hadn't been for that failure, I wouldn't have had that opportunity to bring forth that opportunity for change. You clearly love what you do. That's very apparent in the conversations that we've had in the past. So can you just give us an overview um, of the work that you do? Because it is quite unique. I actually pride myself in being a little bit of a generalist because I dabble in a wide variety of businesses in the current role that I have. Uh, I have, for a whole bunch of years, I have a procurement arm that uh, reports into me and that I uh, modeled for the last 15 years and will continue to model going forward with the team. We take service contracts and we, uh, we do RFPs around them, but we also create the strategy and the program that is uh, those contracts support. So it's not just an RFP, close the door and leave. It's RFP and then monitor performance and work with the vendors on and the sites on how to make them as successful as possible and determine the greatest value out of them. So, and I do that for elevators, I do that for cleaning, the security contracts, generally the large contracts that have meat and potatoes under them, although I don't manage the security program. Uh, that's a very specialized person and group that does that work. We also do waste management and a variety of other things uh, on behalf of Oxford sites. So, that's one piece of the business. Uh, that I'm very proud of working with. And I work very closely with the elevator companies as well as the cleaning companies. And I pride myself in those relationships and those strong partnerships. Uh, another part of the business that I have is our customer service platform and CMMS system. So I have a call center that reports into me that takes requests on behalf of our customers, uh, either by phone or by, by the app or the website. And we pride ourselves in being able to deliver, to deliver a very high level of customer service to them and to work in the innovation piece that allows us to be proactive instead of reactive. It's not only just being a customer service platform that's uh, responding to requests. We're also working with AI and other innovations and technologies to help us get ahead of what our needs are for our customers and what our needs are for our buildings to be able to properly manage them in a proactive way. Now, you said that you're a generalist. How has that helped you in your career as opposed to being more of a specialist in a certain area? I think it's allowed me to stay open and continuously learn. It's great that there are people who are specialists and, and some would argue that I have a high level of knowledge. Maybe I even would argue that I have a high level of knowledge when it comes to the areas that fall within my parameter. Being a generalist, it works with my brain. I think I would be bored personally if I was only focused on one element of the business 100% of the time. For me, I need to have that stimulus working with a wide variety of assets, communicating with a wide variety of teams. I guess I'm a people person, so I love being able to reach out globally to our teams in Australia and the UK and in France and learning about their businesses uh, because a one size fits all just doesn't seem to work as particularly in our operation and working with hotels dynamically, working with residential, office, retail, they're all such interesting and different uh, animals from each other uh, that uh, it just works best with my personality. And then being able to switch from people management to strategy to uh, innovation and where that piece is going once in a while, just for fun, getting to dig deep into a spreadsheet, which I consider to be like a logic puzzle, which is what I do in my spare time. <laughs> 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 we all have our hobbies. It's one of mine. And my husband thinks I'm odd for having logic puzzles as, as a thing that I do for fun. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to join a community dedicated to empowering women to excel, influence, and lead throughout their commercial real estate careers? At Highview Partners, we are proud sponsors of Toronto Crew. 
Part of the Global Crew Network, their members are key decision makers of some of the most influential corporations in Canada. With their quality programming, events, and professional networking, Toronto Crew is a great place to grow your career and gain support from your peers. To learn more about the organization and how you can become a member, visit torontocrew.org. Of all the places that you've worked, what work environment has elevated your performance the most? So I worked in Oxford for 23 years. And then prior to that, I was at two brokerages. So I've been in small environments versus large environments. I would consider Oxford to be large, even comparing where it was when I first started, I thought it was large, even though it was only a Canadian and with a few assets in the US. And now it's a global structure. I work better in an environment which is large because there's a lot more opportunity that can come my way. I've transitioned into different roles within the organization. For me, I enjoy having that opportunity within a single organization rather than having to search and find it at a variety of different organizations and being fulfilled that way. So we've seen a lot of change. Uh, when I first started, it was, uh, it was listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange. So, and I, it was neat in that I was able to buy shares in the company that I was actually participating in and being able to reap the rewards of that and to have that transition then to being part of the Omer's family and the growth opportunities that have come with that. I, I just love that it's given me an opportunity to grow and expose me to a wide variety of businesses and people and environments. And in terms of attitude, how has your attitude helped in your career? I think being optimistic and open to change has been very helpful in my career. I think if you are closed-minded, uh, you would have been suffocated doing the types of roles that I've done. And the fact is, is that uh, I try to be a champion of change as opposed to a uh, hand to the forehead to stop change from occurring. Um, sometimes we run into people who where they feel that that is their role as a protectionist. There is a balance, of course, to honor the past and lead it towards the future. But I think that my positive attitude has always seen the better side of that. Obviously, attitude has helped. Um, but have you ever been part of an unmotivated team? And if you have... What did you do to stay motivated yourself and keep the work interesting? I have been part of an unmotivated team. There was a, a period of time where the company was transitioning and, uh, and restructuring. And so there was a lot of waiting at that time. What was going to be happening next? Who was going to be doing what? what was still going to be moving forward, what was going to be collapsed. So that can take an effect on the morale of the team that's around you, and uh, understandably so. How I, and it, it, was, it was a challenging time. And people that I respected and appreciated were uh, at the blink of an eye gone, unfortunately. But at the same time, it opened up opportunity to say, what am I doing now of the people that have left the roles that they were doing, what are the pieces that we should still be continuing to do? And uh, how can I adopt those to keep them moving forward so that they're not lost? That's where I maintained uh, motivation is it allowed me an opportunity to pick up other parts of the business that I wouldn't necessarily have been allowed to had the company not had that restructuring opportunity. So like you say, the key is really looking for that opportunity. Right. And not just waiting for things to fall in your lap. I had to seek them out and ask to be exposed to them and ask to take leadership in them. That's great advice. Now, in terms of your role in the industry, what impact are you working towards creating at this time? I've historically had to force uh, robotics, both on an internal basis as well as with our vendors, to have them understand what the value it would be to their business to bring that innovation forward rather than just doing their business, same old, say old. And data is a big piece of what I'm trying to uh, capture in an objective and open and transparent way. Often, we have so much data in the world that I'm dealing with, everything is providing data into us, and we haven't had a single platform in order to capture that and properly 
not look at it in a siloed fashion, but to be dynamic with what vision we can use it for and how it can be applied to working better uh, moving forward, not just as a, a landlord ourselves, but in partnership with a lot of our vendors who we need to rely on to receive those data pieces. Now, you talked about robotics. What is one of the coolest advancements that you've seen? Something that really just sort of blew your mind? <laughs> so I, I laugh because some of the things I've seen have been a little bit outrageous, to be honest. Like you, you say they're cool, they're cool, but they're not practical. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for humor, how about I bring this one forward? On a fairly regular basis, I have companies who come to me to tap me on the shoulder to show me their latest uh, robotics project. Uh, some of which I see tremendous value in moving forward, depending on how the uh, the return on investment is and how we can work it into the business case. But this one in particular, I'm really not so sure about. It was a robotic toilet cleaner. So picture a, a robot that has a long extension arm, has to find its way into a public washroom or a, you know an office building washroom. It has to be able to open doors that don't always have you know those sensor motion sensors to be able to open them. And then it has to open a stall and then it has to clean the toilet. So <laughs> And knowing someone that wasn't in the washroom stall. <laughs> exactly. And it would have to be able to uh, control elevator equipment to be able to take itself from floor to floor. And uh, there are a lot of promises that some of these robotics companies make about being able to talk to the elevator systems and not. And uh, we'll see which ones actually can do that role. But I'm still not sure that I would want a toilet cleaning robot that doesn't wipe itself off, especially in this day and age controlling door handles and just how it would maneuver itself from stall to stall, washroom to washroom, and how it could be perceived as being more efficient than a person. There's this fine balance of what are we creating robots for because it's just fun and cool? And what are we creating robots for? Because there's actually a business case and it makes sense. It saves money. It does the job better. It stops people from getting hurt. That's the one where I'm not sure it's going to take. I think I would prefer a human to do it as well. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to swap things up a little bit here. And I'd like to get into the topic of mentorship. Have you been a mentor or, or a mentee? And what value do you feel that each brings? I feel like I've been both. I've been officially a mentor a few times. And I think unofficially, I've been a, a mentee. When I first started at Oxford, there were two individuals who took me under their wing and helped me develop in my skills and showed me the value in uh, the devils and the details, so to speak. So it, it's nice to have that senior person who takes you under their wing that helps you navigate through and can speak on your behalf to help you elevate through the industry and through the organization. So I've been very lucky that way and I've and I've had people who supported me that way. As a mentor, I think I learned more and got more out of that experience perhaps than the mentee did. It's hard to say, and I know that I have uh, friendships that have lasted after that and we still continue to meet on a fairly regular basis one person in particular. It's funny because you go from being what you consider to be young and in the industry to all of a sudden now being, it's like a, a blink of the eye. It happens overnight. Now you're considered to be seasoned and you you wonder when did that happen and how is that the case? But it, it appears and it's out of nowhere, so to speak. The mentees that I've had have given me a vision into how uh, different generations view obstacles in their job. And it's also given me an opportunity to show where I have had struggles to stop them from having those struggles. And hopefully, in some cases, they they won't have those going forward or just being a wheel to bounce ideas off of. Maybe it's a generational thing. I'm not a millennial. I would consider myself to be a Gen X. So um, actually, statistically, I think I am a Gen X. So I've learned a lot from millennials and their vision and how it can benefit 
the organization to be able to move that forward. So I had a situation where I had reported to one person in particular who wanted to keep me in a box. When you're young and in the role, before you've had kids, people perceive you in a certain way. And as soon, unfortunately, or at least during the generation when I was going through this, when I first had my kids, people all of a sudden put a hand to your forehead saying, no, you can't do that because you have to go home to your children. No, you can't do that because you're a woman and you have to stay in this box. That was a big motivator for me, honestly. Forced me to create a business case to actually take that next step in leadership because I was just so fed up with being told, no, you can't do that. You need to stay in your box. You can't go beyond it. Despite the fact that the ideas that I had had would have benefited the organization. So it forced me into a position that I had to prove to the organization what that value was so that they could then get me out of that box or I could get myself out of that box. What I'm finding is, and I'm maybe it's my optimistic view, the people that I've menteed for, they haven't had that box in the same way that I had that box. So that gives me um, a lot of hope. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Now, when work and life gets out of balance, Kim, what steps do you take to keep your mind and body healthy? Well, that's a very timely question, considering we're in the middle of COVID, or at least we've settled into this new life of COVID-19. Prior to, I was very regularly going to the gym, uh, doing a particular Uh, Everybody does whatever they do in their gyms in the way that they want them. For me, uh, because I have, I came from an art school and I was a dance major as uh, in high school. The exercise that motivates me best is what most similarly resembles dance. So yoga and body flow. Are you the Zumba queen? I probably should be. (laughs) 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 And I and I love salsa. Don't get me wrong, but. For me, I love doing that actually with a partner. To me, the whole benefit of of that type of style of dance is your engagement with a partner. And because my focus was more on uh, modern or what's called contemporary dance, which was Limon or Graham technique, I find that yoga more closely resembles it as well as what they call body flow at this particular gym that I do, which is like a combination of Tai Chi and yoga and, uh, and Pilates. So it gives me that same core movement rather than just uh, the jiggling. And I respect people who love Zumba, don't get me wrong. It's just not my cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> So, but I'm finding during COVID, I have less of an opportunity, not that you can't do it remotely, but it just doesn't work for me in the same way. I kind of need to have the people around me. There's a particular friend I have that who we always see each other there. So there's that social aspect that I'm missing. Even just the the back and forth with the instructor and how they speak to the class I miss that piece. So doing it from a recording where the banter is always the same, I just don't get the same level of motivation. So I'm finding right now, I do a lot of walking. You hear a lot of people doing a lot of walking right now. I've always enjoyed hikes. I've always enjoyed kayaking and canoeing. Of course, that's weather sensitive. For me, I need to separate this busyness because I guess by nature, despite being social, I'm also an introvert. I need to have a space where I can go back to for quiet and nature and just being one with the environment. So I really enjoy being able to go up north, doing that, the kayaking and just being on water and just having the silence. I'm not a person who can be talking to someone 100% of the day. I find I I guess everybody has their yin and yang, but if I've spent an entire day talking, particularly when it comes to virtual type of stuff, I need to have the offset of that quiet time, but mostly uh, just self time either. Uh, I think it's meditation. So if, if you're in the, I've never really interpreted it as that before, but if you're If you're kayaking and you're sort of in this zone, it's like a form of meditation. Well, it's peaceful and it's contemplative, isn't it? And there's no distractions. Mm -hmm. So when you're away from the business, how else do you enjoy life outside of work, Kim? 
I have teenagers now. As your kids grow, you change how you're involved with the family and how you have to balance that involvement. So for me, the best, most luscious time is when my 17-year-old twins want to sit down and show you something that they're excited about or enthusiastic about, or they want to tell you a part of their day or something experience or show you a video. There's nothing better than reaping some of the rewards of parenthood when it comes to that. I love to travel as well. And I've, I've done, uh, I've done a lot of travel through work. Uh, all of that, of course, has been shut down now. And I do also appreciate a lot of beach time. But I guess that's part of the yin and yang. When you have such a busy life with your work and with your children, taking them here, there, and everywhere. There are people who take beach vacations and there are people who don't take beach vacations. I am one of those people who, prior to COVID, is a lover of Again, that same quiet that comes from being on a beach as I have from being in the summer and being on water and in, in the kayak. But I'm hoping that once my kids get to a certain age, that they will come back and we will transition more to the type of travel where we're exploring the world, going to Europe. I've been there on my own, but I've never had the opportunity to show them that or my husband for that matter. Just seeing how other people live and learning from those experiences. My husband and I did some traveling before having kids. I'd like to take the kids back to those locations as well. If you only stay within North America, you only see a certain style of life. There's so much to learn when you go to other areas of the world and how other people live. There's so much benefit in that. So I'm hoping to get back into that kind of a world when, uh, when travel is allowed again. Now, we always end up um, on these episodes by offering up some advice to our listeners. So what pieces of advice would you give somebody starting out in our industry, Kim? The best piece of advice, or a piece of advice, perhaps not the best, and maybe, maybe I can give a few pieces. When you're taking on your job, evaluate the environment and the culture that you're joining more closely. I had a work experience where I didn't do that. All I thought about was the role and I didn't properly educate myself on the culture of the organization. I found that to be a toxic, but a good learning experience, right? You can always take the good from the bad, but the biggest piece of advice is make sure that the culture of where you want to join and because you're applying a good portion of your time and your day to this organization, make sure it aligns your personality and your goals because the people are really what keep you, right? If you know that you're working with great people, you can do any hurdle and you, you can succeed. You can work together to get through it. So, and you're constantly learning. You're never going into a role knowing everything about it or everything about the organization or what they're going to expect from you or what the role or the job expects from you. So it's the people and the support have to fit with who you are so that you can thrive. Thank you for listening to People Who Perform, the real estate careers podcast brought to you by Highview Partners, a talent search and recruitment firm focused exclusively on Canadian real estate. If your real estate team is looking to find the best next hire, or if you're ready to make the best next move in your career, then reach out to Highview Partners today. Follow us on LinkedIn and visit us at highviewpartners.ca.